Hello everyone, a very good afternoon. Welcome to the fifth in our current series of deep dives. Today we are looking at an extraordinary piece of music and how it began life as a relatively small song, almost unforgotten in the great pantheon of Beethoven's works and evolved through the three main eras of Beethoven's life to become one of the most famous and beloved tunes ever composed. We are of course referring to his immortal Ode to Joy. But before we start in about five minutes time, I'm just here to say hello to everyone who's here for the live stream and just check that the sound is all working. Sounds good to me. And I've got some buttons to just press. We should have a bit of Gegenlieber. <laughs> Lovely. A bit of Dietrich Fischer Discow. We've got some, uh, Anna's wonderful playing with an orchestra. We've got uh, some solos here. There's Anna. Don't want to spoil it. It's absolutely astonishing. And then the wonderful Bristol Cabot Choir, who I conducted for many years, singing this back in 2005. Here's a little bit of it. More on that in a minute. And, of course, the wonderful Self-Isolation Choir, who sang this. Fabulous. So it's it's a bit of a family affair today uh, with special guest soloists, both Anna England and Dietrich Fischer Disco. <laughs> and uh, other than that, how is everyone doing today? People saying can lose the jacket. Actually, it's fine here. It's lovely and spring like. I've got the window open. It's not stupidly hot today, as certainly compared to yesterday, which was really unpleasant. So today, no, I'm fine. Looking looking smart. You want the teacher in this sort of scenario to look smart. I don't have uh, any glasses that I wear at the moment. I've got uh, I've got some sunglasses. I could sort of peer over them for you, like that. But no, I think I'll 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 keep the jacket. Thank you very much. How's everyone doing? Well, I know we've got lots of people watching this deep dive later on. These uh, these lectures have become some of our most uh, enjoyed and rewatched of everything we've done recently on the channel. So if you are here specifically for the deep dive, well, thank you for coming along. If you want to, if you're here later on, there will be a link in the description to skip through all of the nattering and the saying hello to everyone and the singing of happy birthday, which will happen as always at the start of the broadcast. And I'll put a link, as I said, to the very start of the lecture. And it's going to be a good one today, everyone. This is a really fascinating subject. I've lectured on this several times throughout my life and uh, every time I return to it I discover something new. Uh, of course that's the best way to stay enthusiastic about a subject is to return to it frequently and discover what you didn't know last time. So for those of you who are here watching later on, thank you. Do consider giving us a thumbs up if you like what we do. Leave a comment underneath the video and of course, most vitally, please do subscribe to the channel if you're one of the nearly 50% of people who watch and haven't done so. Remember, there's no charge to be here at Home Choir. There's no charge to subscribe. All it does is add you to the growing number of people who are subscribed to this channel. We're pushing forward to try and get to 4,000 subscribers this year, which would just be fantastic. So if you could please, for me, uh, click that button, it would really make my day. And to everyone who's watching live but not in the live chat, a very good afternoon to you. Hello to Helene and Bill and Val in California. Hello to Sue and Tony and to Sally and Annie and to Maureen. Hello to Anne and Linda and to Charlotte and Nikki. Hello to Huyen. Hello to Val. Hello to Katie and Thornbury. Hello to Harry and June and to anyone else who is watching live but not in the live chat today. And then hello everyone over here. A very busy, a very bustling chat today. Lots of people very hot, so I hope you're going to stay cool. Remember, no singing today. Just make sure you've got a nice drink. Mostly ice in here today. I'm going to drink most of it before I start. I might occasionally wet my whistle during the middle of it, but uh, otherwise, do please just make yourself comfortable and enjoy the lovely music and the marvellous uh, marvellous facts. It's, uh, it's a good one today. Hello to everyone. Let me just pop out the list and see who's here. So, a very good afternoon. Hello, Alison. Hello, Angela. Hello, Barbara. Hello, Biddy. Hello, Carol. Hello, Carolyn. Hello, Christine and Terry. Hello, Colette. Hello, Dave and Jill. Hello, Emma. Hello, Gaynor. Hello, Glennis. Hello, Gloria. Hello, Hilary. Hello, Jackie. Hello, Jane. Hello, Jill. Enjoy your holiday, Jill. Sounds absolutely amazing. Hello, Kareth. Hello, Kathy. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Mary. Hello, Michael. Happy birthday, Michael. Hello, Mike. Hello, Nicola. Hello, Nikki. Hello, Nina. Hello, Susanna. Hello, Suzanne. Hello, Terry. Hello, Valda. 
hello everybody. Let's have a few more likes if you don't mind. And remember, do subscribe if you haven't done so. So what's everyone talking about today, apart from what sounds like an astonishing trip for Jill in Thailand? Looks like Borneo and Kuala Lumpur and all sorts of amazing places. Or well, do have a very safe trip and that just looks amazing. How's everyone doing? People saying grumpy is allowed. Oh, definitely. Yes, if, if you're not if you're not having a good day, grumpy is not just allowed, it's essential. You can't enjoy the rest of your day if you don't get the grump out. So I hope and bearing in mind that Beethoven himself, let me just remind you what he looked like. There we are. That's him on a happy day. Okay. <laughs> it's very interesting. There's very few pictures of Beethoven smiling. Okay, even Mozart managed to crack a grin from time to time in his official um, portraits. But dear old Beethoven, no, I'm afraid. He had a perpetual uh, frown on his face for good reason. We can, we can allow him this. And a lot of the thing, thing we have to remember about Beethoven is uh, he's one of these composers who looks really stern and writes really dramatic music, but he always, always takes us on a journey and usually leaves us somewhere better then he found us. And that, of course, is the story behind today's fascinating subject. So we will get started in just a moment. I'm going to have a quick sip of drink. Do enjoy the session. And I'm just going to scroll and see if we've welcomed anyone else. Well, to everyone who's joined us, are we a bit blurred? I hope not. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be blurred at this end, Glenis. Uh, maybe it's just me age. It might well be the uh, the connection, but it looks fine to me. Hope it's okay where you are. Um, so to anyone who's joined us in the last few minutes, hello, hello, Irena. Good afternoon to you. And uh, to Terry. Terry, I hope you're feeling better soon. And Jill is looking forward to seeing the orangutans. Well, I don't blame you, Jill. Have a fantastic trip. But everyone, we're going to get started. And I'm going to press my magic button here. Blue and start our broadcast. Welcome all of you to the latest episode in Home Choir's Deep Dives. As always, before we start, I'm just going to tell you what's coming up on the channel because it's not all music lectures. We have a lot of fun here, including on Friday, where we will be singing some somewhat boozy numbers uh, with the new song being Roll Out the Barrel. And then on Sunday, well, you can see from this beautiful image generated here, we're going to be dealing with both rivers and swans with some other beautiful music. So we will We'll have uh, the Beethoven Ode to Joy, the, the hymn version, of course. We're going to have Given Silver Swan, If You Love Me, and Deep River amongst the rest. So do join me for both of those broadcasts live if you can, but of course it's all recorded for you to enjoy later on. All the details you need to be a member of Home Choir are in the email newsletter, which is free. Please go to our website, sign up for it. There is no charge. We promise to never spam you. And if you tell us when your birthday is, just the day and month, we'd never presume to ask the year, we will sing you happy birthday. As we're going to now for Michael, who's celebrating his birthday today, and for Alison and Vicky, who are celebrating their birthday tomorrow all wonderful home choir subscribers and so we're going to sing for them there's our notes after two a one two happy birthday to you happy birthday to you happy birthday dear michael allison and vicky happy birthday to birthday to all three of you. I hope you enjoy your day, whether it's today or tomorrow. So everyone, let's turn our attention to the business of the day, which is discussing an immortal theme, one of the best loved, best known pieces of music ever composed, a true song for the world, a kiss for all the world, as Beethoven and Schiller would have put it, the Ode to Joy, which of course is the main theme from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And uh, well, let's let's just regard Beethoven for a moment there in this wonderful AI generated image. I said Beethoven standing in a beam of light. I think that's uh, that's pretty much it, isn't it? Beethoven himself is revered as one of the most important composers to ever live. And a large part of it is down to this work, this Ode to Joy, this piece that is so famous and so well known that practically anyone, if you just start humming, everyone knows how it goes after that. And there are very few tunes actually in the classical repertoire that are that well known. But what you might not know is that work, that tune, 
was with Beethoven throughout his life and he kept returning to it. And we know this is, is common with great artists who perhaps will paint various versions, the same subject again and again throughout their lives. Maybe they're a great filmmaker and they keep returning to that first work. I mean, George Lucas is a good example to keep returning and tinkering with Star Wars or Beethoven did that with this tune that he wrote uh, in his early phase. He returned to it in the mid phase of his life. And of course, it then became this immortal piece in the Ninth Symphony. And it's really a universal anthem of joy, Freude, and unity, of brotherhood, uh, uh, of human humanity coming together. So throughout our chat this afternoon, we're going to touch on the historical and cultural context that influenced this evolution and highlighting in particular a very famous concert, Beethoven's Benefit Concert, which he put on in 1808. And this is a pivotal moment in his creative journey. But before we go back to the beginning and we meet Beethoven as a young man, let's just remind ourselves of a little snippet of our, our destination, of where our journey's leading us. It's to this tune. Don't worry, you'll get to hear that again at the end. Having explored the destination and the journey that leads us there, we start in December of 1770 in Bonn, in Germany. Ludwig van Beethoven was born and was clearly destined for a life in music. His whole family was musical. His grandfather, for whom he was named, was a respected musician. And his father, Johann, was a singer in the electoral choir, both very prominent in Bonn. Very sadly, though, young, young Ludwig's home was marred by his father's rampant alcoholism, and this would be, unfortunately, a def defining characteristic in Beethoven's life. It led to a childhood that was anything but joyful. And yet it was during these early years that Beethoven was first exposed to the transformative power of music. His father, recognising Ludwig's enormous talent and potential, was a harsh but rigorous teacher, and despite this, or perhaps because of this, Beethoven developed a deep connection with music and he displayed a prodigious talent as a pianist from a young age. His formal training was supplemented by lessons from local musicians and by the age of 12, Beethoven had already published his first work. By the age of 12. Now, as Beethoven progressed throughout his career, his music evolved in sophistication and depth. And we usually break Beethoven's life up into three periods, three eras. And the earliest and longest era is from his birth in 1770 to around about 1802. And we call this his early period. And at this point, Mozart, uh, Mozart is a huge influence on Beethoven's work, as indeed is Haydn. And very sadly, although Beethoven would have loved to have worked and to have learnt from Mozart. He was deprived of the chance of doing so. He was very, very, uh, very close to being able to sit at the feet of the great Mozart uh, back in 1790, but was called home to Bonn from Vienna, where he was working and learning, um, because his mother had suddenly died. And so he went home to take care of his family. And on his return, very sadly, Mozart had died. And so he missed out on a chance. It was something he was very sad about and often spoke about. He nearly got to work with Mozart. Imagine what his music could have sounded like if he'd had even a few lessons with the great Mozart. But it's not all doom and gloom because he did get to work closely with Haydn during this period. It didn't entirely go well from a, a relationship point of view. Haydn was quite particular in terms of what he expected from Beethoven and was not always effusive with his praise. Beethoven is also, as I'm sure you appreciate, a legendarily prickly character. He took criticism very badly indeed and quite legendarily stormed out of a performance of one of his works, one of his own works, when Haydn dared to be anything other than effusive with his praise. They did 
mend their relationship by the time Haydn died, however. So this early period from 1770 to 1802 is the early part of his life, and he is finding his voice. He's writing works that are very, very nice indeed, very lovely, but they don't really have that distinctive Beethovenian tone. They're much more like Mozart and Haydn. And this early version of the tune that's going to become Ode to Joy dates from this early period. However, Beethoven was not content with merely following established conventions. And his middle period, which is quite short, but hugely productive in terms of the works he, he put out, is often referred to as his heroic period. And this dates from around 1803 to 1814. And this sees him breaking new ground with works that expand the scope and scale of classical music. His Eroica Symphony, for example, his Fifth Symphony, his piano concertos, particularly his great Fifth Emperor Piano Concerto, many of his best-known and best-loved piano sonatas date from this heroic period. And yet Beethoven was dealing with some immense personal struggles. As, as I'm sure you know, he became deaf in his midlife. Um, he actually attributes this to um, having an enormous row with a musician who wasn't playing the notes entirely right. He had a fit of fury, and he says he can date the hearing loss from that particular moment. It seems that actually he had some form of degradation uh, of, of the uh, ocular system which would have kicked in sometime around his late 20s, early 30s. And in fact, this heroic period, the start of it, also happens to coincide with perhaps one of the most intense periods of his life, where in 1802, Beethoven, realising that he was losing his hearing and at a complete loss as to how he was going to continue, very sadly considered taking his own life. And we know this because he wrote a letter to his brothers, which is famously called the Heilingerstadt Testament. And in this, he says that he, his, he can see no future for a composer who cannot hear. But it's clear that he got through that, he worked through that, and that his greatest works actually came as a result of this struggle rather than, um, well, of, 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 of having lived a relatively normal and otherwise uh, unremarkable life and I think his ability to create this profound music in the face of such adversity just underscores his genius and his late period from when the Ode to Joy dates is from 1815 or so until his death in 1827 and it's characterized by works of extraordinary complexity and depth the Ninth Symphony of course with that Ode to Joy theme but of course the Missa Solemnis his later piano sonatas, his later string quartets. Many of these works are so forward-looking that many people thought Beethoven had literally gone mad, uh, that they attributed a lot of his decisions to the fact he couldn't hear, and so they thought, well, he was just writing whatever he thought would work. In actual fact, he could hear every note inside his mind, but kind of freed from the restrictions of what performers could play. He was writing for an orchestra far in the future. So we have three eras of Beethoven and three eras of this tune. Let's start off with the first version of this tune. It's from a relatively unknown song called Gegenliebe, which is written, we think, around about 1790 to thereabouts, maybe 1795. Certainly Beethoven was in his late teens or early 20s when he wrote this. And I say it's relatively unknown because this is what's known as a W.O.O., a work without opus. It was discovered after the majority of Beethoven's works had been catalogued and it is considered the first seed that would later blossom into the university acclaimed Ode to Joy. Now the melody of Gegenlieb, and you'd see a little bit here, is simple yet expressive. It embodies a youthful optimism and a yearning for a reciprocal love and understanding. And this, of course, is something that Beethoven yearned for and sadly never achieved during his life. We all know about the letter to the immortal beloved that he wrote but never sent. And although he clearly uh, loved deeply, he never married, he never had children of his own. And a lot of Beethoven's explorations of these themes at such a young age speaks volumes about his emotional depth and his ability to translate complex human emotions into beautiful musical phrases. I rather uncharitably in the description of this video called it a selfish love. And the point is that Beethoven at this point is writing, and we can have a look at the 
words here translated into English, the lyrics. They're youthful, they're yearning. If I knew that you showed me signs of your affection and of what I feel for you, if you felt but a tiny fraction, that your greeting in return met my greeting halfway even and your lips did likewise yearn to return my kisses given, then, oh heavens, without thought would my heart be brightly flaming. You know, this is very much a personal idea of love. Beto, at this point, is desperate for companionship, for that immortal beloved, to make him whole, given the struggles he had as a young man with his alcoholic father, losing his mother at a young age. This is a very lonely individual who's calling out for love and using music to do so. And so let's have a little look at this tune. We can see here... So it's very, very reminiscent, of course, of Ode to Joy. It meanders up and down. It's got lots of yearning phrases, that sort of... Uh, those beautiful Mannheim sighs that, of course, Mozart was famous for uh, including in his music. And so it is a song about reciprocal love between two individuals. A far cry indeed from this kiss for all the world that was to come later on. And again, the, sim the simple melody, yet very poignant, filled with this sense of longing that is both intimate and at the same time universal. Let's have a little listen to some of this as performed by the great Dietrich Fischer Diskau. Here's a little bit of Gegenliebe, everyone. <laughs> Ein hundert Teilchen fühltest, das dein Dank zu meinem Gruß halben Wegs entgegenkäme und dein Mund den Wechsel groß gerne gäbe und wieder nähme. Dann, o oh Himmel, außer sich würde ganz mein Herz verloren, Leib und Leben and ich dich in dich vergebens fassen Boden. Gegen uns der Höhe Kunst. Liebe nährt gegen Liebe und entflammt so Feuersbrunst. Was ein Aschenfüllchen bliebe und entflammt so Feuersbrunst. There we are, everyone. If you were people asking in the live chat, that is, of course, the great Dietrich Fischer Discount. And I've linked to the complete performance in the description of today's video. There is actually a big section of song that leads into that, almost like a little introduction, and the tune emerges. And there's a lot to be said to compare that to both the Choral Fantasia and the Ode to Joy, neither of which launch straight into the tune. They all have uh, a journey that takes you to the melody. And it's absolutely beautiful. As you were listening, I would urge you to listen to the whole thing later on. Just remember the sound of Mozart's magic flute. That's all I'll ask you to, to bear in mind. A tune uh, that is so simple, as Mozart would have said, even a coachman can whistle it, with the same sort of jaunty little end and very much the music of a young man. Now, we move forward into the next era of Beethoven, which is this heroic era, and the transformation from Gegenliebe to the choral fantasia marks a significant step in the evolution of this Ode to Joy theme. Now, Beethoven, always the innovator, was not content with letting this melody of Gegenliebe re uh, remain static. Instead, he experimented with it, refining and expanding it over the years. And this choral fantasy composed in 1808 is a clear example of this evolutionary process. Now, the choral fantasy is a really interesting work. It's completely unique. It's a hybrid of styles combining elements of a piano sonata, a concerto, a concert aria, a cantata. There's even a string quartet buried in the middle of it. It's almost as if... This is Beethoven 
showing what he can do. It's like a sort of audio catalogue. So people in the audience listening go, well, he can clearly write for choir, he can write for piano, he can write for orchestra. Is there anything this man can't write for? Now, the piece begins with a lengthy piano solo, a cadenza, which is uh, extraordinarily virtuosic and would have been improvised by Beethoven at the actual performance. What then follows is an orchestral section. The orchestra almost creeps in apologetically as if sorry to interrupt Beethoven at the piano. From there, the Gegenlieber melody, or the now the choral fantasia melody, uh, as is, is introduced and then is passed around the orchestra. Uh, and as the piece develops, voices are brought in, both solo and then choral. And this is very, very new. No one has ever used voices in a symphonic context before. And so let's have a little listen to a section from the opening. This comes just as the piano has finished its extensive cadenza and the orchestra comes in and you hear this Gegenlieber tune for the first time. And remember, Beethoven started this as a piece as a young man. This is now in his heroic phase. You'll hear horns and oboes heralding the tune, calling out to each other. A little nod ahead to what was to come in the Ninth Symphony. And this is Anna England on piano and the orchestra uh, for the Cabot Choir, recorded in 2005. Have a listen. <laughs> So he's passing the tune around the different sections, showing what he can do. Thank you. 
ladies and gentlemen. And just remember, that's a, a tiny little tune, a little love tune that he wrote in his early 20s, a teenage love song that's now become a grand symphonic piece. And you can tell that Beethoven loved this tune uh, because, of course, it was to then go on and be this ode to joy. And it's the innovative use of the human voice in a symphonic context that would become this hallmark of the Ode to Joy, along with this idea of him taking the tune and passing it round the orchestra, almost as if he's going, let's try it here. No, not there. Not there. If you bear in mind what was to come in Ode to Joy, O Freunde, nicht dieser Tone, so, O oh, friends, not these notes, Beethoven is trying this idea out until he finds the perfect home for this tune. Now, of course, the words themselves, written by Christoph Kufner for the uh, choral fantasy, show a, a, an improvement in, I think, Beethoven's view of the world. He's no longer thinking about just his own selfish yearnings for companionship. He's now talking on a, a more, I suppose, global scale. He's talking about living life for now, a wider world of nature, with grace, charm and sweet sounds, the harmonies of our life and the sense of beauty engenders the flowers which eternally bloom. As we go on, something great, when it touches the heart, blooms anew in all its beauty, which spirit taken flight and a choir of spirits resounds in response. Accept then, you gracious souls, joyously the gifts of art. So this is a composer in really his at, the, at his peak he's producing some of the best works he's ever going to produce he's writing this piece for a concert which we'll talk about in a minute and this is what it sounds like when this is sung by the voices <laughs> So we can hear there Beethoven taking this tune, giving it to soloists, and it's banded around with the female soloist, then to the male soloist, and then, of course, what he's building to is this grand statement, which no one's ever heard before, a symphonic context and the choir. Here they come. big sound from the choir. Bear in mind this started out as a tiny little love song. Here it is in all its glory. Now, why did the choral fantasia uh, end up at, uh, there being played in December of 1808? Well, it's because Beethoven held his only ever benefit concert at the Theater an der Vienne in Vienna, uh, and he featured the public premieres at this point of his fifth and sixth symphonies, the fourth piano concerto and the choral fantasia. Now this concert took place in a very cold hall. This is December of 1808 and it lasted for about four hours. It featured a full orchestra, a chorus, vocal soloists and Beethoven himself as the soloist at the piano. Now, the theatre itself, Beethoven's concert venue, was one of the largest and most lavishly equipped theatres at the time. It was described as the most comfortable and satisfactory in the whole of Germany. Interestingly, 
It had been opened a few years earlier by the imp impresario Emmanuel Schikaneder, who, of course, was the person who commissioned Mozart's magic flute and sang Papageno in the first version of it. Now, Beethoven had premiered several of his significant works at the theatre. In fact, had even lived in the building for some years at the beginning of the 1800s. And he provided his works and services to a series of charity concerts there. Now, after much lobbying... Bearing in mind that the theatre itself was much in demand in Vienna, Beethoven was permitted to use the venue for his benefit concert on the 22nd of December in 1808. The concert started at 6.30pm in the evening. It had two sessions separated by an interval. The first session featured Symphony No. 6, that's the pastoral, the concert aria Ar Perfido for soprano, solo and orchestra, the Gloria from the Mass in C for soloists, chorus and orchestra, and the Piano Concerto number no. 4. Now that in itself is quite a long first half, but the second half of the concert, well, they were treated to the iconic Fifth Symphony, the Sanctus from the Mass in C, and the Choral Fantasia. Now, that's a heck of a lot of music for one concert. But unfortunately, by all accounts, the execution for the music was inferior. One review of the performance targeted the orchestra, saying that it could be considered lacking in all respects. Initially, Beethoven had chosen the soprano Anna Milta to sing the Ar Perfido scene and aria, but she unfortunately dropped out of the role when Beethoven insulted her. So instead, the soloist was the teenage Josephine Kilitschi, the sister-in-law of Ignaz Schuppensich, who was so taken with stage fright that she butchered the solo. Another aggravating fact was that it was incredibly cold there in Vienna in December, and the audience was shivering in their seats. And the lowest point, unfortunately, in the performance occurred during the choral fantasy, which had been so poorly rehearsed, uh, adherence to the score fell apart at one point, leading Beethoven to stop and restart the piece. Now, uh, someone who was there later wrote, When the master brought out his orchestral fantasy with choruses, he arranged with me, this is the concert leader, at the somewhat hurried rehearsal with wet voice parts as usual. I love that, as usual. <laughs> that the second variation should be played without repeat. In the evening, however, absorbed in his creation, he'd forgotten all about the instructions which he'd given, repeated the first part while the orchestra accompanied the second, which sounded not altogether edifying. A trifle too late, the concertmaster noted the mistake, looked in surprise at his lost companions, stopped playing and some, somewhat dryly called out, Again? A little displeased, the violinist asked, With repeats, yes, came the answer, and now the thing went straight as a string. So, and although it didn't go well, imagine being in the audience for that concert. Imagine. Everyone there was a fan or an admirer of Beethoven. This was to launch a new phase of his career and to raise some much-needed funds to allow him to continue composing. They were listening at this concert to Beethoven himself at the piano, premiering his new works in a marathon four-hour concert. And this choral fantasy at the end of this extensive programme must, despite its full start, have had a profound impact, prevent, uh, providing a unique combination of piano solo, vocal soloists, chorus, orchestra, with this wonderful theme reminiscent of the earlier Gegenlieber. And it demonstrated Beethoven's innovative spirit and his ability to push the boundaries of music and a glimpse at what was to become the Ninth Symphony. Now, very sadly, though, as I said, this was Beethoven's only benefit concert. His hearing by this point had almost completely gone, and the Revolutionary War that had been sweeping Europe reached Vienna in early 1809, literally weeks after this concert. And in the spring of 1811, with all of the pressure that was on him for various family matters, Beethoven fell seriously ill and took nearly a year to recover. Throughout 1812 and 13, he had all, all sorts of additional challenges. His beloved brother died, leading to protracted and rather repugnant series of interactions with his brother's widow over her son, Carl. And this is worthy of a deep dive in and of itself, although it doesn't make very happy listening if you are fans of Beethoven. Beethoven, although he's a heroic figure for many, was a very damaged individual, and his behaviour towards his nephew and his sister-in-law shows that he's capable of horrific and overbearing acts of malice. 
Now, as we move into the last era of Beethoven's life, he is now profoundly deaf. He has moved out of public life because of several disastrous performances, including, unfortunately, that choral fantasia. But he was still much loved. His music had found an audience and was frequently performed, unfortunately, without Beethoven in, in attendance, and there was a great clamouring for him to return to public life. He wrote the Ninth Symphony in 1824, with the last movement, of course, including this incredible Ode to Joy. The premiere took place on May the 7th of 1824, and this was the first time that Beethoven had appeared on stage in 12 years. The audience, well aware of Beethoven's health and his hearing loss, instead of applauding, all threw their hats and scarves in the air as he appeared so that they could see his, he could see their overwhelming approval. Now, the Ninth Symphony is often referred to as the Choral Symphony due to its incredibly innovative use of the human voice. Beethoven was the first composer to include human voices within a symphony. Of course, there have been many more synths, but Beethoven was the first. Additionally, with the orchestra for the Ninth Symphony was enormous, far larger than had ever been put together for a symphonic work, and it had a running time of well over an hour, which was much longer than any other symphonic work up until that point. And this work represents a major turning point in the development of classical music. It was like a catapult into the Romantic era that was just waiting to be born. Bearing in mind that Beethoven is what we consider a bridge composer, Although he was born in the classical era, he died in the Romantic era, and his works show a transitionary aspect where his early works sound like Mozart and Haydn, and his later works were a, uh, were a touchstone, were really an influence on what was to follow. And composers in the Romantic era, following Beethoven's example, frequently began to break the traditional rules of composition and explore the use of larger and increasingly larger ensembles, extreme emotion and very unconventional orchestration. Now, the Ode to Joy text that Beethoven employed and slightly modified was written by the German poet Schiller in the summer of 1785. It's a celebratory poem addressing the un unity of all of mankind. And the opening lines translates to, oh friends, not these notes, rather let us tune for something more pleasant and more joyful, joy itself. And the poem continues conveying a message of universal brotherhood and joyous celebration. And we know that Beethoven, much like the choral fantasy, spends the first few minutes of the last movement effectively leafing through the earlier movements, like skipping through a playlist to try and find the perfect music with which to set the amazing words. And we can see here just some paragraphs taken from Schiller's text, the lyrics to the Ode to Joy. All creatures drink of joy at nature's breast. All the just, all the evil follow her trail of roses, kisses she gave us and grapevines, a friend proven in death, ecstasy was given to the worm and the cherub stands before God. And the last uh, paragraph, which of course has that incredible uh, last, uh, last choral statement, be embraced millions, the kiss to all the world. And the last line, seek him above the starry canopy, above stars must he dwell. This tune which began life as a simple yearning love song, became a song in his middle age, his heroic age, for living for now, for nature and for brotherly love. And here it is, a kiss for all the world, a song for all of humanity, not just at the time he was writing. Beethoven was writing for the choir and orchestra that he heard in his head, which was an orchestra and choir that had not yet been created, that had not yet been born. Beethoven was writing for us here in the 21st century and beyond still this universal song of love. And finally, let's have a listen to what that little tune that he composed in his 20s became at this, his greatest moment. Thank you. 
enjoyed that performance. You can, of course, listen to the entire last movement as played and recorded by the Self-Isolation Choir and the Orchestra for the Earth. If you just put in Beethoven's Ninth Self-Isolation Choir, you can listen to the entire performance. And thank you to Self-Isolation Choir, now Choir of the Earth, for allowing me to use that recording. So, everyone, that is the end of our lecture. A simple tune became one of the best-loved and most important tunes of the 19th century. And everything that Beethoven set in motion was then carried on by those great composers of the Romantic era. And we're going to talk about some more composers who this time transformed the Romantic era into the 20th century. Our next deep dive looks in particular at the opening of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde with his very famous what's called Tristan Chords, but we're also going to look at what the composer Debussy, who in many ways is one of the first composers of the 20th century, what he did with those Tristan chords and what we're going to have to just refer to as epic trolling. But in the meantime, everyone, I do hope you've enjoyed our deep dive today. It's uh, been a delight to revisit this work. And of course, huge thanks to the Bristol Cabot Choir, to the orchestra, to Dietrich fischer Diskow, and to Anna England for their wonderful contributions to our lecture today. So if you enjoyed what we do, please give us a like, do subscribe to the channel, and thanks to everyone who donates, even if it's a small amount, it all goes in to keeping this channel going. So do join me on Friday this week for some slightly boozy songs and sing Sunday, where we're going to sing that beautiful silver Silver Swan, Deep River, and more besides. But in the meantime, everyone, Freude, may your day be filled with much joy, and I do hope to see you again very soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.